praise the Lord. Um, I meant to uh, mention we have a number of visitors this evening, uh, and some of the, the chants that you uh, have heard tonight may go back all the way to the time of Yeshua and before. And he may have, in fact, even chanted some of these chants uh, just like we are doing tonight. So uh, even if you don't know him and, and the first time you come, it's pretty hard to uh, be able to uh, follow along. But uh, we trust that as you heard those chants that uh, they might uh, be a reminder that uh, some of these chants have been around for a long time uh, and that they have been uh, a part of the liturgy of our Jewish people and sometimes these chants go back hundreds, even thousands of years. And uh, last week, uh, our Shabbat service began on the final day of the seven-day observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And according to the calendars, we really weren't supposed to read uh, the regular weekly portion uh, from the Torah. But I was so focused on discussing when we were going to observe first fruits that I got confused as to when the Feast of Unleavened Bread was ending, so I covered one of the Torah portions, portion Shemini, uh, and uh, as such, this week I'm going to cover two more portions, and then next week, which has a double portion, I'll cover just one, and then we'll be all caught up and in sync with everybody else. But we're ahead, okay? So that's a good thing. It'll be more like they're catching up to us. Uh, or it could be just that our rabbi is a little confused. Well, you can play it either way. You know, it's, it's all in how you, you present it. Um, in last week's portion, we saw that Nadav and Avihu, uh, Nadab and Abihu, to some in the south, uh, or people from southern Israel, uh, were consumed by fire from the Lord for offering up Esh Zara, uh, strange or unauthorized fire. And similarly, we read from a uh, Haftarah portion where Uzzah uh, was struck dead when he reached out to keep the Ark of the Testimony from falling out of a cart uh, when David was transporting it back to Jerusalem. And finally, uh, we saw that something similar took place in the New Covenant Scriptures uh, in the book of Acts uh, where Hananiah and Sapphira, or Hananiah and Sapphira, uh, both die as a result of deceiving the Holy Spirit, uh, as it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, Lord, we come before you this evening uh, desiring to better understand the truths found in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would speak through me uh, a, a reality, uh, a, a helpful word. Uh, an encouraging word, uh, Lord, to those who are here. And Lord, I pray that by your ruach, uh, you are able to take the words that I say and make them meaningful for whatever is going on in the lives of those who are here. I pray eyes would be open to see, ears would be open to hear, and hearts would be open to understand, Lord, what you would reveal tonight. For your glory and honor, I ask that the words of my mouth and the med meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Well, speaking of observing days, uh, we've already kind of, uh, may have alluded to it. Earlier this week, we observed Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, as we held a service to remember those who perished and the heroes who were willing to risk their lives to try and save some of them. We remember the six million Jewish men, women, and children who suffered and died simply because they were Jewish. We also remember the 12 million non-Jewish people who also perished at the hands of the Nazis. And while these events were horrific, we also saw that the Lord was able to use the events of the Holocaust to reestablish the Jewish people in their own land in fulfillment of numerous prophecies that were recorded thousands of years ago. Amen. Which is why the Knesset selected, the Hebrew parliament uh, selected a date, uh, the Israeli parliament selected a date for Yom HaShoah that would place its observance uh, after Passover but before Independence Day. 
Uh, they wanted the deliverance of Passover to be something uh, that was separated from the events of the Holocaust. But they also realized that those events led uh, to the founding of the nation uh, in fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, the uh, day on the Hebrew calendar was the fifth of ER, the fifth day of the second month, uh, was when the Jewish nation declared its independence in 1948, uh, which next week will be the 73rd anniversary, uh, and we will be celebrating this event uh, this coming Tuesday, and all are inv invited uh, to join us as we celebrate the miracle of uh, probably the greatest miracle of the last 2,000 years, the miracle of the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. Uh, in last week's portion, uh, we also discussed from Leviticus 11 what animals were considered clean uh, for the Israelites and which ones were unclean and therefore not to be eaten. And tonight we will talk about uncleanness that is a result of childbirth uh, as we are going to discuss portion, portion Tazria, uh, which starts out in Leviticus chapter 12, talking about the ceremonial uncleanness that results from childbirth. And of course, we heard about that uh, in the New Covenant portion uh, that we read in terms of uh, events in the life of Yeshua. But he's not the only one uh, that has experienced childbirth. Uh, anybody else been through that? I mean, you may not remember it, uh, but unless anyone here was cloned, we've all been through it, right? Now, clean and unclean are distinctions that most believers don't see uh, as relevant to us these days. Uh, and those who do concern themselves with this issue may have wondered, how are we to treat those who are, uh, would be described as unclean? What does that mean to us? How, how should we treat them? Should we treat them the way uh, lepers used to be treated, perhaps, based on uh, Leviticus 13, verse 45, which says, everyone who has Sara'at sores is to wear torn clothes and leave their heads uncovered. They are to cover their upper lip and cry, unclean, unclean. But today we are the lepers forced to cover our lips, our face uh, with a mask. And this is not a political statement, uh, but for fear that we will be contaminated or contaminate others with this virus. And if someone coughs or sneezes, we find ourselves wanting to head for the exits or dive for cover. So the new normal is really an old normal that has become new for us. But are we as concerned with the contamination of this world that we were exposed to long before this virus existed? Do we avoid the evil and the temptations of this world or do we allow it to seep into our lives and spread like leaven, inhibiting our ability to serve our creator in sincerity and truth? Uh, the first portion for this week, Tazriah, consists of Leviticus chapters 12 and 13. And we find that what causes the uncleanness is really um, the blood uh, that, that is a part of the birthing process uh, that will um, cause the woman through that process to uh, come to a place where she is considered ritually impure or unclean. Uh, in Leviticus 12, verse 6, she is told to bring a lamb for an olah, uh, sometimes it's translated burnt offering. The Hebrew, uh, a much better translation would be a rising smoke offering. And she's also to bring a pigeon or a turtle dove uh, for a, a pigeon or a dove for a sin offering uh, to the entrance of the tent of meeting, to the Kohen, the priest, who according to Leviticus 12, verse 7, is to offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, as we read earlier. Now, why does she need atonement? Uh, the answer, you really have to understand the Hebrew um, because uh, the conclusion I've reached is ani lo yodea, which means I don't know. Um, but it could be a reminder that we are all born in sin, uh, the fallenness of Adam, uh, and it could also help us to more readily see that there's a connection between blood and atonement. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, 
for the life of a creature is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your soul, for, or for yourselves. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by the reason of the life. And while here the blood of childbirth defi defiles, previously in the events of Passover, it was the blood that brought deliverance. In Exodus 12, verse 13, the Lord told the Israelites, the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague, referring to the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, will destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. According to Leviticus chapter 12, verse 2, if the baby is a male, the mother will be considered unclean for seven days with the child to be circumcised on the eighth day. And then the purification process continues for a total of 40 days. Now, a little bit of a quiz here. I occasionally like to do that. Circumcision was the sign of which covenant? Abrahamic covenant, right? So along with... Um, the way I often try to describe it is that the Mosaic Covenant seems like much more a part of the Abrahamic Covenant rather than a placement, a replacement for it, uh, as some would tend to um, believe. But I think the idea that circumcision uh, is talked about in the Mosaic Covenant but uh, is really the sign of the Abrahamic Covenant shows that it's not... Um, one instead of the other. But if the child is female, the times of uncleanness and purification are doubled. Why? Once again, anilo yodea. I don't know. Some speculate there may be a difference in the way a woman's body reacts following the birth of a female child. It could also be an acknowledgement that this child will go through this process when she eventually gives birth to a child uh, much later in her life. Others think it might be a reminder that God has created us distinctly, male and female, for his purposes. Uh, Genesis 1 verse 27 says, So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The differences in the times for a boy and a girl could also be tied to the Lord knowing that at some point, this world would be blurring the distinctiveness between male and female. Uh, we didn't see this coming uh, that long ago, but we sure understand uh, that the Lord could have seen this afar off. Uh, and so perhaps we need to be reminded that he has created us differently for different purposes, uh, that we would be reminded of this every time a Jewish woman who was living, living in obedience to the Torah gave birth. Or it could also be a reminder of what it says in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 or 28 uh, in other translations that the hidden things belong to the Lord. Leviticus 12, verse 8 says, if the mother can't afford a lamb, she's to substitute two doves or two young pigeons. And earlier we read from Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 21 through 24, where we see uh, Yeshua being circumcised uh, on the eighth day. And then uh, after the time of her purification is fulfilled, uh, his mother, Miriam, uh, brings the uh, sacrifice that is required um, by the Torah. As we see that much of the New Covenant scriptures are based on truths that we find in the Torah. Uh, that, that Yeshua who led a life that would have been perfect according to Torah, as he is described as sinless, and uh, sinfulness is defined as transgressing the law. Yeshua never did that uh, in his entire life, which is what makes him suitable as a sacrifice uh, to be offered up on our behalf. The sacrifice had to be without blemish. So it's not simply believing um, that he is God or that, um, you know, he's a, a been able to uh, attain some level beyond ours. But his sinlessness is a statement that God was able then to use him uh, as the sacrifice. In his um, unconditional love for us, he was willing to offer up his son 
uh, as the sacrifice that not only brings forgiveness for our sin, which is an amazing thing in and of itself, but a restored relationship with the creator of the universe who desires intimate fellowship with each one of us. Our God is an awesome God. In Leviticus chapter 13, we find the discussion of defilement continues, but in this chapter, it results from a skin condition uh, called sara'ah. And you, we uh, have used that term uh, already one time. It's a Hebrew word that's often translated, or I would argue mistranslated, as leprosy. Unlike leprosy, which is a medical condition that can be treated by doctors today with modern drugs and therefore uh, doesn't involve the miraculous, sara'at is a spiritual affliction that results in ritual impurity and is evaluated not by a doctor, but by a kohen or a priest. Uh, kohen is the Hebrew word for priest. Uh, only God sends this disease and only he can remove it. Also, unlike leprosy, Clothing and houses can be contaminated by tsara'at uh, as well as we find in Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. Now, according to a Jewish website, this is how tsara'at came to be translated as leprosy. Though tsara'at is most often translated as leprosy, it has almost nothing in common with the disease we know by that name today. The translation came about because in the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures uh, that was carried out by uh, approximately 70 rabbis, which is where the term Septuagint comes from, Sara'at was translated as lepra, which in Greek meant rough or scaly. Later, English translations made the connection from lepra to leprosy. I would argue they made the leap from lepra to leprosy, because in ancient Greece, what we now call leprosy was known as elephantiasis. So uh, this misunderstanding uh, leads to many people reading passages about Sara'at and deciding it's no longer relevant or meaningful because uh, this is an, a, a, a condition, a disease, an affliction that modern science is able to treat today. But in reality, they are two completely different things. And uh, <coughs> we see uh, part of the purpose for Sara'at is actually found in the New Covenant Scriptures. Uh, there are two accounts uh, where Yeshua healed Sara'at. And Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum teaches that this was one of the miracles that only the Messiah could perform. So if indeed uh, Yeshua was able to take men who were afflicted uh, with this condition and to heal them to the point that the Kohen, the priest, would pronounce them uh, as ceremonially cleansed from the disease, uh, that would be a sign to the Jewish people of that time that he was indeed the Messiah, uh, that he could perform uh, this miracle that uh, many miracles uh, were not exclusive to only uh, Yeshua. There, there were, was the ability of the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders and the priests sometimes uh, to do things um, that we would consider miraculous today uh, in terms of healings. Uh, and, and that should not be a surprise to us because we believe that believers today uh, in the authority of the Messiah with the power of the Ruach, the power of the Spirit, are able to pray for healing for one another. And some even have the gift of healing. Um, so it was not unique to the Messiah. However, healing lepers, or healing uh, Tzara'at, that was going to be a special miracle uh, that only the Messiah was able to perform. And in Mark 1, chapter, uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45, Yeshua heals a man who had Tzara'at and then tells him to tell no one. Uh, once again, a picture that if he tells someone, that would be an indication. They would say, who was able to cause you to be healed of Sara'at? Because we are going to uh, say that that is the Messiah, but it wasn't yet time for Yeshua to uh, reveal himself. So he told him to go to the Kohen uh, to verify the healing in accordance once again with the Torah. Now, the second account is when Yeshua doubles down on this miracle, as they say today. 
or more accurately, doubles down five times by healing 10 men of Sara'at, as recounted in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through uh, 14. So we see that uh, perhaps this condition uh, that is described in the Torah uh, is really something that the Lord instituted uh, so that one day, thousands of years later, Yeshua could demonstrate to, the, to his own people that he was indeed the Messiah. And we would find out that not only is he the Messiah of the Jewish people, but he came to bring reconciliation for all who would call upon his sacrifice uh, for their sins. So we are thankful that diseases like this exist because we are actually uh, have been blessed uh, through them in ways that we may not have appreciated before tonight. Uh, the second Torah portion I'm covering this week is called Metzorah, which means someone who's been afflicted with Sarah'at. Uh, the portion begins in Leviticus chapter 14, uh, where we find this elaborate cleansing ritual um, that is described uh, as um, a ritual that is to be used uh, for someone who has been declared free of Sarah'at um, by the Kohen. Uh, it's a seven-day ritual. It involves cedar wood, uh, crimson scarlet, hyssop leaves, and two clean birds. And actually, in all of those elements, uh, there are truths that can be meaningful for us today. Uh, and we'll examine just a few of them just to give you an idea. For example, the crimson scarlet uh, described in Leviticus 14 that would be a part of the mixture that is used uh, in this ritual is uh, in the Hebrew, shani tola'at, which are the words for crimson and scarlet, uh, and they are used to describe sin in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, where it says, Come now and let us reason together, uh, says the Lord, though your sins be kashanim, though they be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be chatola, uh, like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so we, we find that um, just as we saw atonement was a, a part of the sacrifice that uh, Miriam was to bring following her purification, that the, the role of the blood uh, is tied to our sin, tied to our need for atonement. And many people in the world believe that the way we are able to obtain atonement is just by being good, by being good, decent people. Um, but the reality is, how good do you have to be to satisfy God's standard of righteousness? And the answer is perfect. And the problem is none of us is perfect. So we have a standard that we can't achieve. We are in serious trouble unless God helps us figure out what the solution is. And that is exactly what he has done. And we see it throughout the scriptures. It starts, um, you know, some people think the Bible starts at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, but it actually goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. All the way through the end of the book of Revelation, we find how God has shown us that we cannot achieve righteousness by our own efforts, that we cannot be good enough to satisfy his standard of righteousness. So, he provided his own arm. He provided his own son in fulfillment of the test of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember the Lord said to Abraham, we're going to test whether or not you are going to be faithful to this covenant. And what is the test? You're to take your son, your only son Isaac, and you're to offer him up on the altar. And we know that Abraham was ready to do that. But what we sometimes don't realize is that when the Lord told Abraham, I'm going to test the covenant by the rules of that covenant, whatever applied to one party was applied to the other party of the covenant. So when the Lord said, you need to offer up your son as a test of the covenant, the same was true of the Lord. He had to be willing to offer up his only son as a test of the covenant. So the Abrahamic covenant wasn't really inaugurated until Messiah Yeshua's sacrifice 2,000 years ago, thousands of years after 
Abraham and the Lord entered into the covenant because Messiah's sacrifice was the fulfillment of the testing of that covenant. And so we realize, okay, in those covenants, the Lord said, even though you aren't able to satisfy the standard of righteousness, my son is able to do it in your place. He was without sin. That's what the new covenant scriptures record for us. Uh, as we look at situation after situation where he was tempted, uh, just like we are, the difference is he didn't give in to the temptation. He was able to remain perfectly obedient to the Torah, God's instructions uh, for us when we walk on this earth as to how we're to relate to one another and to relate to the Lord. And Yeshua came and set the example. In some cases, he came just to clear up the understanding that had come to exist by that time. But what was clear is that he came for the sacrifice that we needed because that was the only way that we could be seen as righteous in God's sight is by the miracle of the sacrificial system that was instituted long ago where somehow because I sin, I bring an animal, I place my hands on the head of that animal and by some miracle that nobody can explain, my sin is transferred to that animal and that animal is without blemish and his perfection and his righteousness is transferred to me in God's sight. And we see that uh, fulfilled in its ultimate fulfillment in Messiah Yeshua. He constantly uh, gives us this picture that uh, only the blindness of the flesh and uh, being tempted by the things of this world would enable us to read these various accounts, to read the New Covenant Scriptures and not see the state that we are in and how our loving Heavenly Father unconditionally provided His Son as the way of reconciliation. Did we deserve it? No. We didn't deserve it at all. But that's what unconditional love is all about. And that's the love that we're called to display. Uh-oh. That means we're supposed to love people when they don't deserve to be loved. And that enables us to overcome the craziness that exists in our world today where the, everybody is battling to be right and to convince people that they're right. Well, the love that we are called has nothing to do with who's right and who's wrong because we're all wrong. We all fall short of the Lord's standard of righteousness. But we can love unconditionally because that's how we are loved. And when we love unconditionally, we understand that love that the Lord displayed toward us in an even greater way. Thank Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Okay, now i got to figure out where I am. Uh, I think it was Isaiah 118. So that was where our sins were um, compared to the, the colors of crimson and scarlet and had become uh, white as snow, where we're uh, seen as being like wool. According to Leviticus 14, verse 5, part of the cleansing ritual involves one of the two birds being slaughtered in an earthen or clay plot over a uh, clay pot. We'll try saying that fast three times. No, all right, clay pot. Uh, and it was over Mayim Kaim is what it says in the Hebrew. Some translations say running water. Uh, the literal translation is living water. Uh, and that becomes interesting because in Yochanan John chapter 7, Yeshua said that who, whoever believes on him, out of our belly will flow rivers of what? Amen. Living water. Amen. Connecting all the way back. You know, his followers... The people who were hearing Yeshua speak most of the time were Jewish. And so they would have made that connection immediately. And if we're knowledgeable about the Hebrew scriptures, we're just going to see that there's all kinds of these connections that we can find. Uh, we could even stay here all night, but that's just a rehearsal for uh, what we do on Shavuot. Tonight we're going to wrap up at uh, hopefully a decent time. Uh, on the seventh day, according to Leviticus 14, verse 9, the cleansed mitzvah rise to shave his head, beard, and eyebrows, wash his clothes, bathe in water, and he will be clean. And on the eighth day, Leviticus 14, verse 12 says, an asham, a guilt offering, is to be offered up. 
The blood of the guilt offering shall be applied by the Kohen to the tip of the right ear, thumb, and big toe. Uh, and then olive oil is sprinkled seven times and then applied to the same places as the blood was applied. Finally, the rest of the olive oil, oh, I got ahead of myself, is poured over the cleansed person to make atonement for them. Uh, and, and oil is frequently a sign of the spirit of God. Uh, so it, it, once again, we see the connection because when we received atonement, forgiveness for our sin, we received the spirit of God uh, as earnest, as a down payment on uh, the spirits that we will one day have, perfect spirits and glorified bodies. Uh, as we've mentioned previously, one of the reasons for the guilt offering is for unintentional sin because unintentional sin is still a violation of God's standard of righteousness. Uh, remember, we talked about that um, ignorance of the law was no excuse, okay? The idea that, that we don't intend to sin doesn't change the fact that we've violated God's standard of righteousness. And so atonement is needed whether the sin is intentional or unintentional, but Yeshua is described in Isaiah 53 as our guilt offering. He is the offering for the sins that we didn't even know we committed. Isaiah 53 describes the suffering of the suffering servant. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says he was wounded because of our transgressions. The Hebrew word there means rebellion. Uh, I researched that, thought that was interesting. Uh, it, it's not simply sin, but actually we have rebelled against the ways of the creator of the universe. He was crushed because of our iniquities, uh, which is the poetry of Isaiah 53, the parallelism. Now, when I was first shown these verses as an a unbelieving young man in college uh, who had been raised in traditional Judaism, though not very observant, uh, there was one thing I was sure of, and that was when I read those verses in my Jewish Bible that looked just like this, uh, that those verses were going to read a lot different because I'd never heard about anything like that uh, existing in the Jewish Bible. But those words that I just read are directly out of this translation. He was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Uh, and... Um, I was shocked that this concept even existed. And then in Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, yet it pleased, the Hebrew word there is to delight. Uh, it pleased the Lord in that this was his plan all along. Uh, it pleased the Lord to crush him when his soul uh, shall be made an asham, uh, is what it says in the Hebrew. Your translations may not even reflect it. A guilt offering that he might see his seed and prolong his days. Now, a guilt offering was offered up on the altar. So it seems like these words from this Jewish Bible are predicting his suffering and his resurrection. Now, we've also been going through the book of Joshua, and I just want to discuss that briefly. Uh, we've been going through that because it's traditional for the Jewish people to go through the weekly portions each year, and that gets them through the first five books, Genesis to Deuteronomy, where they uh, are on the banks of the Jordan, just ready to enter into the promised land. And then we go back and start all over again, and it seems like they never get in. So we're doing Joshua to find out whether they ever made it into the promised land. So in uh, Joshua chapter 16 is what we're going to discuss tonight. But two weeks ago, we were discussing ja uh, Joshua 15. And we, uh, in there, we saw um, the first uh, giving out of the land uh, to one of the tribes of Israel for the land that was west of the Jordan. Uh, the two and a half tribes had already received uh, their land east of the Jordan. But now Judah, Yehuda, the tribe of Yehuda, uh, was the first um, tribe to receive land west of the Jordan by lot. Uh, and we uh, saw a description of the land that was given to them, uh, including uh, there was land given specifically to a representative of that tribe uh, that went in to scout out the land along with Joshua and brought back a good report. And of course, you know that I'm talking about Caleb. Caleb. Okay. Told me a thing. Very good. 
Um, and, and the chapter ended with an interesting statement, and we're going to see a stem, similar statement in the chapter we're going to talk about this week. Joshua 15, verse 63 says, Regarding the Jebusites dwelling in Jerusalem, Judah's descendants were unable to drive them out. We read this earlier. So the Jebusites, or I take that back. We read it for this week's chapter. Uh, so the Jebusites are, Je are dwelling with the children of Judah. And that is something we see even in our day today where the Jewish people regained possession uh, of Jerusalem in 1967, but they share the land with Arabs who were living there prior to 1967. They've, been, they've allowed them not only to stay, but in 1948, full citizenship was extended to them, uh, as we will be talking about this coming Tuesday, such that there are Arab representatives in the Israeli government. Uh, I guarantee you it does not work the other way around. There are no Jewish representatives uh, in Arab governments. I'm not sure uh, that there ever have been. Uh, in Joshua 16, we find a description of the land that is given to Joseph's two sons, who are Manasseh and Ephraim. They're given land by a single lot, and then it's split up between them. Joshua 16 starts out describing the southern border of the land given to both of them. And as we go through the chapter, the land that is given to Ephraim is described as being part of the land that was given to um, Manasseh. All, the, all of the lands and cities discussed are found west of the Jordan. And I mention that because some of uh, Manasseh's descendants, if you'll remember, wanted to settle on the east side of the Jordan in what is today part of the land of Jordan. But the other half of the tribe received their inheritance in the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And I have prepared a diagram so that this will be a little clearer. I forgot to get my pointer. Um, but right in the middle, kind of in the gray, you can see Ephraim. If you look on the back screen, it's pink, so don't ask me about the colors. But anyway, and just above Ephraim is Manasseh. And also um, to the right of that and up, you see kind of the same color. Um, so, and I show another uh, depiction from some other people that's slightly different. And I realize you can't see it out there because I can't see it here. Uh, and even though your eyesight's probably a little better than mine, uh, you can see it on the back screen though because it's much uh, clearer in terms of colors. And in our new building, we will probably, instead of having a screen, which depends on a projector, which may not have crystal clear colors. Uh, we are, and I say new building. We are planning to find a new building uh, to move to and or to build one. Uh, and I trust that when I put something up on the screen, uh, we'll have a uh, essentially whatever the latest LCD, LED, uh, who can keep up with it all, you'll see the actual pictures. Um, but what we see here is um, Manasseh and Ephraim got virtually all of northern Israel, most of it, uh, and uh, Manasseh got the greatest part, including uh, part of the land east of the Jordan, just as uh, he requested. And sometimes uh, the reason I showed, too, is because some people show Manasseh's land as connecting all the way to the Mediterranean. Uh, some show Ephraim that way, and others show him as not going all the way. It's, it's left to um, interpretation and knowledge of where the uh, cities are that are described uh, in the verses. And, and the verses are very specific. I mean, I'm sure uh, that when they were first written down, people would know exactly uh, what they were referring to. And many of those cities still exist today, but some of them uh, may not, and in other cases, the wording's just not all that exact. But once again, in the final, oh, and the other thing is sometimes um, Manasseh's land east of the Jordan and west of the Jordan is, con is um, touching, uh, connected, and sometimes you actually uh, have to go through some other land to, to get there. But in the final verse of Joshua 16, it says, similar to what we talked about earlier with Judah and Jerusalem, the descendants of Ephraim did not drive out the inhabitants of Gezer, which Joshua 16, verse 10 says, the Canaanites have continued to dwell in the midst of the children of Ephraim, uh, but it notes that they serve them as servants or slaves. And the point of all that is, there are some commentaries that see this as disobedience, that they should have 
um, that, that the tribe should have taken it upon themselves to drive out uh, the inhabitants of the land. Others just see it as a statement of fact that the people uh, continued to coexist uh, with the inhabitants who were in the land before them because the Lord has said he would drive them out uh, and perhaps they were waiting uh, for him to do that. We've seen tonight that Sarah'at was a state of ritual uncleanness that manifests as a physical affliction uh, and that Messiah came and used um, that condition, that affliction to demonstrate that he was indeed the Messiah. And the only way that we are able to go from unclean to clean, the only way we are able to be cleansed is through the blood of Messiah Yeshua, uh, receiving his sacrifice on our behalf. So if you are here tonight and you have not received Messiah Yeshua's sacrifice on your behalf before, but you need that, you realize that you need the cleansing that only his sacrifice can provide for you. And all of us uh, were in the same boat and at some point we recognized our need. So if you were here tonight or even watching on the video, I would just like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, is there anyone who would just raise their hand to say yes for the first time in their life? Yes, Yeshua, I need to be cleansed by you tonight. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. We never take for granted that everyone has made uh, that decision. But for those of us still in an attitude of prayer who are already uh, have already accepted Yeshua's sacrifice. Perhaps you uh, have come to see this evening that uh, you've been contaminated by this world, that you went out to transform the world, but uh, it's also possible that uh, the temptations of this world uh, will cause us to be contaminated, that our flesh uh, will go after it. But you realize that you need to say to the Lord tonight, Lord, cleanse me. Purify my heart that I might serve you in truth. Remove the things in my life that are not of you, the things that make me unclean in your sight. Or maybe the Lord has shown you some area in your life where you've given in to the temptations of this world, that there is a sin that is blocking your relationship with your creator. He provided the way to remove that barrier. And it's not through anything that you can do other than saying, yes, I receive Yeshua's sacrifice on my behalf because you are able to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and ask him to give you victory over the temptations of this world so that you can be an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. Or perhaps the Lord has shown you something else tonight. I would just ask if you feel like the Lord is showing you to make a change in some area, that you would just raise your hand as a sign of your commitment to him. I'm not even going to call it out. It's just between you and the Lord. Uh, as you can say to him tonight, I want to remove any contamination or uncleanness that causes me to be seen uh, as unclean in your sight. I want to better understand your holiness and to live a life that is worthy of having your spirit dwelling in our midst as Lord we thank you for forgiving our sins and for cleansing us from all unrighteousness we thank you for the many blessings in our lives so many that we take them all too often for granted and we find ourselves complaining when we should be praising him Lord touch us in our uncleanness that we might be cleansed give us a renewed spirit and a renewed passion to serve you as we thank you that you love us we thank you that you want the best for us we thank you that you have so much encouragement for us in your word uh, if we will only spend time with you. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, in the life of our congregation, and in the life of our people, Israel, as you continue to demonstrate your faithfulness as we will celebrate next week. And we ask all these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everyone said, Amen, amen and Amen.